I hope that uh, that I've been able to synthesize uh, our experience at Lane Transit District uh, in a recent um, uh, Medicaid brokerage rollout, and, and hopefully there's some lessons that uh, will be valuable for you guys um, out of that. So first, I'll just kind of start by describing a little bit about um, uh, what's been going on with Lane Transit District. So uh, way before me, we have always had this service called Rysource, uh, and that is our one call um, service. We run our ADA paratransit services through it. Um, Terry Parker uh, has been extremely active in trying to um, build a host of funding sources and uh, other human services to run through that uh, call center and, and better support the community. So there's, like I said um, before, I think we're running somewhere between 10 and 12 programs um, actually out of that call center. Uh, there is a dedicated fleet that we use for the um, ADA, so we do dispatching, uh, we do ride reservation, we do ride scheduling, um, and then as of uh, 2006, we also interface with third-party taxi providers in the community in order to provide Medicaid service. Again, all those calls coming through our call center. Uh, so there's quite a bit of work uh, that's been done, and I'm riding on some uh, pretty significant coattails uh, today in, in that area. But I'm going to focus mostly on uh, the Medicaid rollout because that's what my experience has been with primarily. So. In 2006, uh, there was the commitment uh, to bring on a Medicaid brokerage into the call center, um, and it uh, applied certain stresses to the organization, which I think um, revealed that some of our planning was very good and we were able to anticipate those stresses, and some of that planning showed that uh, there were holes and we could have done uh, some things better uh, and, and suggested adjustments to our long-term strategy on how we would uh, better facilitate coordination because you're talking about Medicaid, you're talking about ADA, really different cultures, really different businesses and we didn't want to be doing a Medicaid business over here and an ADA business over here but just kind of have them under the same roof coincidentally. We really wanted to continue to treat this as ride source. Our identity, our program, but providing an array of trans human services transportation to our customer base. Um, part of those uh, stresses were that, you know, uh, LTD's board uh, was definitely interested in seeing this program not cost us anything. You know, if we're going to bring on Medicaid, Medicaid should pay for that. You know, we're being contract, we're contracting with the state to provide them this service for our region. Um, so there was that tension coupled with the Medicaid interest in only paying for their services. So how do we achieve that in a coordinated environment when a call taker may be scheduling a ride for someone who's ADA and then in the next minute a ride that is an ADA and the next minute someone who's on a Pearl Buck DD or a mental health trip or a shopper run or any one of these things, what do you do when you have people from multiple programs on these buses, how do you distribute those costs? Um, also, what do you do with the administrative overhead? It was completely unrealistic given the complexity of the environment that we uh, saw introduced in 2006 to have call takers record timesheets. There was just no way that they could divide their time out um, into these levels. And we also discovered that these call takers, they were going to be a lot more than just call takers they were going to be customer service representatives. And we're now almost starting to look at them as account managers. So uh, the degree of complexity that we encountered in trying to achieve a real integrated level of coordination for our call center um, has led us to some conclusions about what type of turnover our call center can survive and still keep the level of staff education of, um, at a, at a level that effectively serves and provides consistency uh, of ac across all of these uh, programs and the way that our customers are served under the un under those varied rules. There was another aspect to that 2006 rollout that I think Lane Transit would, District in particular was experiencing, and that is that we needed to shift from sort of more manual tools and processes 
to more automated tools and processes. Uh, our volume in general, in general was increasing to the point that we just couldn't do it by hand anymore. Staffing out the complexity, staffing out the volume uh, was not an acceptable option in a lot of these cases. Um, Get trip scheduling was a good example. It, just for the dedicated fleet, just for the for the ADA, you know, exclusive of this whole Medicaid rollout, our our business was in transition. So that was an additional um, tension that we experienced. We knew that we were focusing on a Medicaid rollout. Uh, one of the ones that we were prepared for was security, and we don't talk a lot about this. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about it more toward the end, um, but. In our Medicaid contract with the state of Oregon, we're business associates under HIPAA, which implies a completely different level um, of technical appreciation for data security and that sort of thing. It implies a different contractual level between um, our service and the providers, the taxi providers locally, that actually um, provide the trips. And so we had to pay attention to data security. And it wasn't just a technology decision. You know, there were um, things that we did in the technology employing, employed as tools, certain ways of utilizing encryption, two-factor authentication, things like this, um, to manage our relationship securely with those prov uh, providers. Uh, but it was also in staff training. You know, again, I keep coming back to staff training. You know, how does a CSR, customer service representative, um, answer the phone? Do they say, excuse me, ma'am, is this your address? And wait for a yes or no answer. Or do they ask, can I have your address, please? And then validate it. Um, identity security is a, a really important component. And I think what we discovered um, uh, in, in establishing those procedures and those protocols for Medicaid, we realized, gosh, this really applies to ADA. You know, who is our, our, our customer base in ADA? Well, it's elderly, it's people with sometimes limited cognitive function. These people are high value targets in the identity predator uh, uh, identity theft environment. Um, so that's something that I think, uh, you know, LTD, because we've grown up in this call center environment and, and we already have certain software pieces and certain things that have been managing the business for a long time, um, we're having to go back and revisit security for a lot of those systems. If you're a startup, you know, you have an opportunity now to get, get some techno, uh, uh, technology help, some technical expertise, um, and evaluate that and it, uh, for, for the tools that you're going to use in technology, but also for the, your business practices and procedures and protocols and, and so on. Um, I mentioned that, uh, okay, so information completeness was a little bit of a surprise. It's difficult to get information back from your providers. <laughs> you know, you can get the bill, <laughs> and, and you could probably get the mileage, uh, but just exactly what vehicle and, and who performed it, uh, you know, you can maybe get that. Uh, write it in the contract. Make it part of your, part of your uh, requirements, basic requirements for doing the business. Um, but... I think that what we've discovered is that uh, we, while we got the essentials from our providers, uh, when we come back around, we're going to want to get more, more information, more information about how shared rides were grouped with these providers. Uh, and, and they're usually using their own dispatch systems. So it's kind of an interesting twist because we have our own systems where we record the rides, we ship them over to the providers, they, they do their thing. Um, and then how does that information get back? Because we need it for NTD reporting. We need it for reports to Medicaid. We need to justify our costs. I mean, there's there's magnitude of uh, needs that we have in, in our, uh, just to be able to report on that data and get that information back. And the last thing is um, identifying administrative overhead. That was tough. And uh, we actually involved a consulting group um, because, again, we're in this position where we really have to justify our costs to Medicaid and also show our board that in taking on this new program, we aren't costing the district a whole other arm and a leg in addition to this ADA service and these other services that we've got. So um, we uh, involved uh, some consultants and we tailored that to really do a business analysis 
Um, it, it, we weren't necessarily looking, I mean, we were looking for a product, but we weren't looking for, hey, give us something that'll do it. We really engaged them to uh, have them go f from top to bottom of, of our organization and really gather an understanding. We specified, okay, if you've got an ADA background, you've got to bring in Medicaid experts. If you've got a Medicaid background, you've got to bring in ADA experts. Um, and uh, we had a very, I think, successful um, uh, relationship with that consulting group. It was nice to have the third party perspective. And in the end, uh, they recommended and, and published a, a cost model uh, that we use today. And in rolling out the, the Medicaid brokerage, in navigating those stresses and tensions between our relationship with the state and the relationship with LTD, and, and really co consistently I would say aggressively campaigning with the, our state that we're a technology partner with you. We are a business partner with you. Um, I think it, we were able to draw from a, a well of goodwill with them. And when we presented that cost model to them, we got approval. They signed off and said, you know, you can use this model to bill us for your Medicaid expenses. Um, it was a complex model. <laughs> you know, we're way beyond counting trips. You know, we actually implemented a uh, random moment sampling engine. Because like I said, in the coordinated environment, your call taker can't keep time logs. Um, so we actually do random sampling of active work hours and, and then roll that as uh, a, a cost factor that forms a distribution that then spreads our costs out across all these different programs. So, um, and that, that was a, that's been really successful. And if you're uh, looking at technology, what do I do with technology? I don't understand software. Um, one thing that's really important and a principle that can always guide your decisions is technology is a tool. Technology will never come in and do your business for you. It will never come in and roll out your brokerage. Uh, if, if you don't approach it as a tool which can help the business you're already doing, the business you already know, uh, it can actually get in the way, become a roadblock. Another principle is you always want to be able to um, compromise the technology to fit your business. You never want to compromise your business to fit the technology. And I think it's important to be able to handle the new demand that's coming, handle the new volume that we all know is, is going to come, and automation can help to do that. But I like the medium scale regional, uh, regional approach that allows us to continue to work with individuals. Um, there are always going to be exceptions, and the technology can't be designed to handle all of the exceptions in the world. But if it can handle 80% of the business, then you can have skilled trained staff to manage the 20%. I really think that there is an opportunity by employing software in such a way that, say, Lane Transit District can have their system that works, but then offer and or extend our set of services to other regional brokers. So that if Salem eventually needs to send rides to Oregon, that it would be possible through these completely different systems to interrelate to for lane transit to present their services and say hey you know you can post rides into us and we'll we'll manage it through our set of systems and salem can say well i have a ride that's going there and so out of a, a salem unique system they can connect and send that information over into the lane transit system um you know I, I'm an idealist, I'm pipe dreaming a little bit, but that's complex, that's hard to pull off. That, that takes a lot of uh, software design and architecting to pull off. Um, but uh, as we begin to, to um, build our, our, our software as services, I think that this medium size, medium scale sort of regional approach can actually work and interwork. Um, I, don't, I don't think that these regions necessarily have to be isolated pools with their own unique rules that, that can't talk to the rest of the world. So.